The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Welcome back to our consideration of the book of James. This is our fifth session in the book of James, and we'll be beginning with verse 16 of James chapter 1. In our last session, we were dealing with the verses 13 through 15, in which we are told that when we fail, when we sin, we can't blame that on God. That's from our internal desires, our internal lusts that we don't control. But now as we move into verses 16 and the rest of this chapter, we get into some very positive admonitions and some very positive attributes of God himself. Let me read verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is a great passage on the goodness and the immutability of God. And by immutability we mean his unchangeableness. Don't think God brings bad things. He brings good things, even if we sometimes think they are hard when we receive them. But don't let anybody fool you about the sources of good and the sources of evil. And so James begins verse 16 with the statement, be not deceived. Now that statement could lead to two different thoughts that James might have had. He might be telling us, don't be deceived at the deception of false teachers regarding the nature of God and the source of good things, and he could also be talking about the deception and the allurement of the lusts and the sins that he discussed with us in the previous verses. Sin flourishes in our minds when our minds are deceived, when they are thinking wrong. And James said, don't let your lust and desires blur your thinking. Because the battleground is in the mind. The battleground for our children is in their minds as we try to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So far it is from being true that God is the source of evil. He is, in fact, the ultimate source of good. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above, James tells us in verse 17. And it comes from that which is unchangeable, has no variation. It talks about the unchangeableness of God. I'd like to take just a moment and share with you at least six sources or reasons that sometimes things come into our lives that are not pleasant and that we don't understand. Number one, and I take this from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Verse 11, it says, time and chance happens to us all. Sometimes things just come into our lives and it's just a happen chance. People die. Accidents happen. Disease hits. We don't understand why it hit this particular person and not us or sometimes why it hits us. Sometimes things just happen. God does not micromanage every aspect of our lives. But there are times in scriptures where we see, number two, things happen to people as retribution for sin. David, as good a man as he was, had much sin in his life. And he paid consequences. God forgave him of those sins, but the consequences for those sins did not necessarily go away. Number three, sometimes things come into our life that aren't pleasant. But they're preventative. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that he had this thorn in the flesh, and he came to realize that it was a blessing, even though he had probably prayed many times for it to be removed, 
because it kept him humble in his mind rather than becoming proudful. Sometimes God may send things into our lives to educate us. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 and following, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, seems to have been one who learned a very valuable lesson by some of the harshness that God allowed into his life. I also think, number five, that sometimes things come into our lives to help us have a greater anticipation of heaven to come, to loosen us from the things of this life and look forward to heaven more. But as we get to this 17th verse in James chapter 1, I think James is telling us sometimes good things come even disguised as things that we might think are bad, but yet they are for our good. Every good gift is from above, from an unchangeable God. Think how difficult following the Lord and worshiping him would be if God changed every day or every week or every year. We wouldn't have that steadfastness. We wouldn't have that assurity of who he is and who we are to glorify. His unchangeableness has to do with his being. He's always the same. It has to do with his perfection. He's always perfect. It has to do with his purposes. He always has the same purpose toward man. And it also has to do with his promises. Every promise God has given us, and there are many in Scripture, he will keep. James says to us in James chapter 1, verse 17, that since good gifts have always come from God, we can be confident that he will only send good gifts or things that are for our benefit in the future. That allows us to have the stability of his creation. It allows us to have a stability of, of worshiping him. It was Herman Bovnik who once wrote, talking about God's immutability, he said, and I quote, The doctrine of God's immutability is the highest significance for religion. The control between being a becoming marks the difference between the creator and the creature. Every creature is continually becoming. It is changeable, constantly striving, seeks rest and satisfaction, and finds it in God and in him alone. For only he is a pure being and no becoming. Therefore, in Scripture, God is often called the rock. End quote. What I find interesting about that is we often think of ourselves as human beings. But maybe it's almost more appropriate for us to consider ourselves human becomings. Because as Christians, we are continually becoming more holy. We are becoming more sanctified. That's the process of sanctification. And we're not a finished product and probably never will be a finished product here on this earth. God is a finished product. He cannot become more holy. You and I can continually become more pure and more godlike in our actions. We don't become God, but we become more godlike. So it's helped me to think of myself maybe not so much as a human being, in terms of being completed, but being a human becoming, in that I am continually, we are continually on the road and the process of becoming like God. There have been many people who have struggled with the idea of how can bad things happen if God is so good. But we need to remember that God is the greatest good, and he is the source of all good. The problem that we sometimes have with goodness and therefore with pain and suffering is that we define goodness from our finite and fallen perspective and then maybe fault or blame God for failing not to be good in our own eyes. Man thinks a good person doesn't knowingly allow starvation, beatings, rape, murder. And if God is good and all-knowing, then it would seem that we have a contradiction. God does not want those things to occur. Those are because of the fall of mankind. If you go back to the first two chapters of Genesis, you find out what God had in mind for man. Purity, obedience, eternity, 
man fell, and the whole rest of the Bible is God's attempt working with us and through us and for us to get us back where he intended for us to be in the very beginning. But sometimes things do come into our lives. I mentioned Job earlier in my last session. You might remember all of the calamities that befell Job. He lost his cattle. He lost his ten children. Just calamity after calamity. And yet in the end, or toward the end of that book, Job makes an interesting statement. He says, now I know God. Now in chapter 1, he's called a righteous man. But in the end of the book, after going through all of this, Paul says, now I'm really beginning to understand God. All of these difficulties brought Job to a place of greater understanding of God. Now, I know this is a hypothetical thing, and I, I, we really can't answer it, but if we could speak to Job today, if we could go to paradise or whatever internment Job has and say, Job, are you glad you went through all of those difficulties? What do you think Job would say? Well, obviously, I can't answer for Job, but I think it's likely he would have said, absolutely. Not because they were pleasant at the time, but because they led him to a much closer relationship with God. Haven't you had something in your life that seems hard, painful, sad, but as you come through it, you find yourself closer with God? Well, in verse 17, it talks about the Lord giving gifts to those that are his. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It's kind of interesting that those two were, the, that the word gift is used twice in that verse, but it's from two different Greek words. The first gift is from dosis, and it means a giving. It is the act of giving. The second gift is actually the gift, the bestowment. So we have first the act of giving, God gives in a loving manner, and secondly, the gift that God gives is a loving gift. God not only gives good gifts, he gives them in a good way. And then we come to the immutability or the unchangeableness of God's character and the beauty of that stability. As I said earlier, what if God changed? We'd never know exactly where we were to be. And then in verse 18 it says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits." of his creatures. Victory comes from being what God wants us to be. Victory comes from godly living. The phrase he brought us forth is the same concept that James used in chapter 1 verse 15 when he talks about bringeth forth sin, bringeth forth death. The word maybe is purposely used to contrast each. How sin comes when we yield to temptation. How good gifts come when we yield to God. But the meaning here in verse 18 is that we owe the beginning of our spiritual life and all that is good to God. When it speaks about that we are the first fruits of his creation, we are the portion of that which is offered to God. It reminds me of Paul's words in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 where he says to us, Therefore, my brethren, be a living sacrifice. Give of yourself a holy and acceptable gift to God. This first fruits. The writer here, or James, is using the thoughts of bringing forth that which is bountiful, that which is productive. A father begets his own children, and they become much like the father. God begets men by his word and truth as Christians, and they become more godlike as they become sanctified. But now we move to verses 19 through 21. And in these verses, we are told that it is better to listen than to speak. Let me read for you verses 19 through 21. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, 
and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James recognizes here and is speaking to us about the great chasm between hearing and doing. He's going to continue that thought well into the remainder of the book. And it's a chasm between hearing the word of God and doing and obeying the word of God that many never cross. It was A.W. Tozer who said, It appears too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right, but are not willing to endure the inconveniences of being right. Now, in the ultimate, being right is not an inconvenience, but I know what he means when he says that. Sometimes the easier path, the broad way, as Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, that feels easier, is the way that even Christians sometimes try to take it. But we need to endure whatever comes our way in order to be right. After dealing with trials and temptations, now James come to his major theme, living what we say we believe. And if I could say there was one overriding theme from this entire book, James is telling us, live what you believe. And he gives us three imperatives in these coming verses. In verse 19, he says, listen. King James, I think, renders that here. In verse 21, he tells us to accept the word of God as we hear it. And then in verse 22, he's going to tell us to do it. You know, Ezra was an excellent example of this. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statues and ordinances in Israel. He had prepared his heart, and then he did it, teaching these things. Ezra was a man who listened, who accepted, and who did. And he's one of the great men of God in the Old Testament. Now going back to verse 19 in a little bit more detail. You know this, my beloved brethren, but let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Beloved brethren, we found this term before. In chapter 1, in verses 2, and in verses 9, the reference to brother. And we've also now introduced to the concept of being swift to hear, which means to be eager, to pay attention, to learn by listening to have an attentive spirit. It's not simply hearing the words, it's, but it's rather digesting them, ruminating, meditating on them, taking them in. And then he talks about that we need to be slow to wrath. The Greek word here is orge, O-R-G-E. And it means to have an excited mind, but to be passionate, heated, almost uh, including the idea of, of maybe losing our, our control for a moment. The Christian who would strive for per perfection has to deal with his emotions at this level. James is going to give us a fuller treatment on controlling our tongues when we get to chapter 3. But the admonition here, be slow to wrath, was given by Paul when in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, he said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The same being also condemned by him in a number of other passages. If we treat men according to the first promptings of anger, we will almost always do them wrong and we will regret what we have done. And all of the apologies and all of the forgiveness is good, but you can never take back that which is done. Brother Zur in his commentary said, Swift means eager or ready to hear the word of the Lord. Eager to hear the word of the Lord. I like that sentiment. No man can be too eager to hear the word of God, but he should be slow or discreet in what he says. Likewise, he is not condemned for the mere fact of becoming angry, but that he should bring himself into control and not be inclined to fly into a rage at every provocation. Sometimes anger is appropriate. We should become more angry when confronted by sin. We should probably be more angry than we often are with Satan and his devices. But Christians are to always be under 
control. Then in verse 20, he says, For the wrath of man worketh not, or does not produce the righteousness of God. It is the proud man, the conceited man, who is often easiest to be made angry and has the most difficulty cultivating humility. In James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, The Lord gives grace to us. And he says specifically in that verse, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's a passage taken from the book of Proverbs chapter 3. All men should be like that person who when told some derogatory remark that was spoken against them could simply say, I'm well aware of that. I've talked to the Lord about that in my prayers. Or if we haven't done that, we maybe should thank the person for bringing it to our attention So that we can work on it. You know in Galatians chapter 5. There is a listing of characteristics of the fruit of the spirit. Sometime turn back and read those in the latter part of Galatians chapter 5. And ask yourself. Which one of those do I need to work on the most? Which one of those do I need to ask the Lord and his spirit to help me the most? Well all of us can find the need for help in many of those areas. A man who controls himself may avoid sin in his anger, but he will seldom work the righteousness of God because he's worked up by wrath. And here in this passage, he says, the wrath of man just doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Now moving to verse 21. Wherefore, lay aside or put away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What's able to save our souls? The word of God. If it is implanted, if it takes root, certainly reminds me of the parable in Matthew chapter 13 of the sower. And when that word of God or the seed as it's described in that parable hits that good soil, it takes root and it grows up and matures. And brings forth fruit. Not only fruit that benefits others around the Christian. But fruit that can save that man's soul. Paul uses this in many of his passages. The idea of laying aside or or putting away lying. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 11 he says. When I became a man I put away childish things. How many people, how many times you and I haven't put away childish things? We are to receive the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it must be received. The implanted word has to do with the word taking root in a man's heart. The idea of God planting his revealed truth. In Deuteronomy 30 and 14, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. In Jeremiah 31, 33, I will put my law within them and I will write it in their hearts. This implanted word, this laying aside of wickedness and placing the word of God within us. In verse 22, he says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Because then you're only deluding yourself. This is one of the central messages of the entire book. In chapter 1 that we're in, in verse 22 here, 23 and 25, he says, be doers. James is continually saying, don't just hear it, do it. Christianity is a volitional decision to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And it issues forth a Christ-like lifestyle. It's exactly what Paul referenced in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man that behold himself in the face of a mirror. He's like a man who looks in the mirror and then he forgets what he looks like and doesn't do anything. Most of the times when we look in the mirror, hopefully if we see a hair out of place or if ladies see their makeup not right, they do what they need to to at least as they see it correct. 
Well, he's saying here that as hearers of the word, if we don't do, it's like looking in the mirror and then not making any corrections. Hearing has to be followed with correction and action. As we study the Bible, the Bible studies us. And from that, we need to learn what the Bible will do. In verse 25, he says, But he that looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and continues, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh, this man is blessed into his, blessed in his doing. There are two Greek terms in this, in verses 23 and 25, for look and observe. The first has to do with the idea of, of beholding and observing. But the second one has to do with looking intently at, closely examining. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, we are told to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. And then he talks about the perfect law. This is not a reference to the law of Moses. This is a reference to the perfect law. This is a reference to observing the word of God, the light of God. It's the concept of having a law that is complete and not a law that is only partial in its doing. This law of liberty is what I believe Paul had in mind in Romans chapter 8 verse 2 when he says, For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made you free from the law of sin and death. The law of Moses made people slaves to it, trying to do all of its various aspects. The law of Christ, that perfect law of liberty, frees us up, not for sin. It frees us up to serve God in ways that are even deeper. But it frees us up from some of the ritualism that was under the law of Moses that Paul said in Colossians 3 was a schoolmaster or a school task to bring us unto God. In mental and spiritual matters, it is impossible to accomplish things that are impossible with material activities. Therefore, it is only through spiritual activity that we can accomplish these things. I think it was Chesterton who said, The word has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found hard and not tried. Even the law of liberty requires us to dedicate ourselves to Jesus Christ. It has boundaries. Freedom and liberty without boundaries is chaos, wickedness. The law of Christ still has boundaries within which we are to be obedient in our lifestyle to Christ, but it is certainly much freer than the law of Moses was. And as we enter into verse 26 here, we find Three very important components. First of all, there is control in verse 26. And then we're going to see compassion and clean living in verse 27. Verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is useless. Control of our actions, control of our speech, control of our lives for good works. That is a key to pure religion. It is clear from this that James is addressing this letter to people who have deceived themselves in some manner and had accepted the premise that they were saved without control, without good works, or the practice of true Christianity. This concept of being controlled in our tongue and in our hearts is so important, and James will come back to this later. In verse 27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, that's compassion, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, that is clean living. So in these two verses, we have control, compassion, and clean living, all three, are requirements of pure religion, as James is giving it to us in these particular aspects. To be unspotted from the world means to be free from the vices commonly practiced by the world. 
pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our Lord Jesus Christ is this. Holiness, purity for the Christian, is not a radical separation from society. It is not to isolate ourselves or draw away, but it is an involvement in the needs of the poor and the socially ostracized. I think that's why he uses the reference here to the fatherless and the widows who didn't have the social safety nets that we have today to care for them. And the church had a tremendous responsibility. Each Christian had a responsibility to deal with them. But you and I today have that responsibility too also. In Galatians chapter 6, it tells us, As we therefore have opportunity, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. I think we do have a special responsibility to care for one another as Christians. But as we are able to, we are to also care for those who are not Christians. Now that does not mean we can be undiscerning. Because caring for them can become enabling them. We have to have wisdom in understanding what care and help really is. But James is very clear here telling us that we are to be controlled... We are to be compassionate, and we are to be living clean and holy lives. What a masterful job James does as he takes us through what we call his first chapter. And he will continue his masterful work as we begin to look next time at the second chapter of the book of James. I want to thank you for being with us, and I hope that our time together is time well spent that as you've opened your Bibles and gone along, that you will find our thoughts and our comments to be in accordance with and in harmony with God's Word, and that we can all learn from it, and that we can take it to heart. And I think James' greatest prayer for us is that we will take our beliefs and turn them into practical Christian living. Thank you for being with us, and we pray for you as you continue your studies until we meet again. For now, that concludes our discussion of James chapter 1.